Welcome to Tea Time with Shaylee and Amber, the podcast where we talk about all the shit that your horse wants you to know and what you can do about it. Amber is a horse trainer and a personal results coach, certified in Theta and Semitic Breathwork. Shaylee is an animal communicator who also teaches communication. Both knowledge seekers with the intention of sharing that knowledge and hoping that we can encourage the listeners to do the same. Welcome to today's podcast where we dive into the world of horses, healing, and personal growth. In this episode, we explore the power of personal stories, discussing how these narratives can evolve and shape our lives, discover the profound healing potential of horses as they reflect our emotions and provide a safe space for self-expression, learn why developing a true partnership with your horse is key, going beyond external guidance to truly understand and learn from these magic creatures. All right, let's get going. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. If you missed last week's episode, we talked about money and the lack of the thought of the lack of it in the equestrian world. My woes, of course, um, another woe, another day, another woe um, about losing my horse, trying to find a horse, getting all panicked. Just to let you guys know, I am on the other side of that now, sort of. Um, I'm no longer panicked about finding a horse because Amber helped me realize, one, Amber made me cry, which was so rude. And then two, she helped me figure out why I was so worried about finding another horse and like the deeper rooted message. That was cool. Um, which by the way, if you guys are listening to this in July, we have been like, um, so Amber's astrologist, Denise, and all these other astrolog- astrologists that are on Instagram are posting about how July is like a wacky wavy month. And, and like, um, Amber just sent me something last night that like the 17th, which was yesterday, if you're listening to this in real time, um, it was like a day of like clearing everything out and like major turn. And like this week in particular is old stuff coming up. Um, it's an invitation to like clear out old baggage, old, uh, what do we want to call it? Old energy and stuff that we're holding on to. So we can like (laughs) allow the new stuff in. And it's so interesting because I'm finding that for sure in my own life. Amber's finding that in her life. And like every client that I talk to is going through like so much change at once. Um, So if you're listening to this real time, hang in there because that's like a valid thing. (laughs) It's happening. It's happening fast. Um, Yeah, I like calling them stories, right? Because I feel like stories are always up for like your own interpretation and like the reality is like did it happen that way or did I feel like it happened that way (laughs) and like if you have a story about like the way things were and are like you can always change those (laughs) so they're they're like they're what's the word I'm looking for they're mutable not mutable form form of what the heck you know I'm talking about you can change them. Oh, if you're not, if you're just listening to this, I'm making a weird movement with me. Like dough. Oh, cool. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, it's like you can shift your perspective and you can create that new story around. Oh, what? It, uh, maybe it wasn't that way. Maybe that was my perception from my own lens and beliefs back then. But I can look back at it now and realize that's not at all what happened. And you can kind of shift that. So I like stories because I feel like that's what my brain does. It's like, oh, okay, that's the story I was telling myself, but that's not actually what was happening. (laughs) So yeah, it's Mm -hmm. been a wild ride so far this month. (sighs) I know this is kind of random, but I feel like I should tell you, speaking of stories, um, I talked to this horse today and like, he kept saying that he was this little girl, like service horse. It was like the most wild session. It was so cool. Um, he was like this little pony, um, belong. I don't know how young the girl is. She looked pretty young, maybe like 11 or so. And, um, it was the first time that I was talking to them and she was just kind of wanting to know like what the pony had to say. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm super fun. Like I want to go English and Western want to do barrels. Um, love chasing. He showed me goats, but she was like, Oh, we chased my donkeys around all over. 
Um, and he talked about like going in the water and showed how he like goes, he's like a little hippo in this pond and she, I guess, rides him in the pond and stuff at, at their house. And like, it was just like a super cute session. And then like all of a sudden he's like, okay, on a serious note, like he's like, I had to tell you guys like all of that stuff so that sometimes horses do that or animals in general, they're like warm the person up. They're like, yep, yep. Here's something that you can validate in your own life. Warming you up, warming you up. All right. Got to tell you something deep now. <laughs> um, and so he was like, by the way, like I'm a super safe horse and I need you to know that like I came into your life at this specific time for a reason. And like, I'm her therapy horse. And I was like, oh, that's really sweet. Like therapy. And he's like, no, like I'm like a service horse. Like she has physical things going on in her body, in her chest, in her lungs and in her immune system. And I will start coughing or acting up when I can feel something's wrong in her body. And the mom told me that she had to have heart surgery last month and that she had something going on with her heart. And like the little girl, she was like conferenced in on the call. It was so cute. Um, and she was like, oh my gosh, he's been coughing. Like ever since that happened to me. And like, he, when he goes out on trail, he's being really spooky. And he's like, yeah, that's because I'm trying to protect you. And like, when I feel your heart rate go up or your blood pressure or whatever, and you're getting nervous about something, I'm not going to go forward because I'm like protecting you. So by you pushing through that, you're like pushing through my ability to protect you. And it was so cool. Cause it, I could just hear her like listening to what he was saying. And he was like trying to invite like this, like softness into their experience and like, let her know that it's more than just like kick and pull and turn and, and stuff. Like he's like, there's a reason. And he was so cute. Cause he was like, yeah, she's <laughs> totally ADB. Like, so many squirrels, so many, like she has so many thoughts and she talks all the time and she has so many different things to say. And I freaking loved it because like throughout the session, like I'd be saying something, she's like, mom, 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 like I have to, and she like had to say stuff. Right. And I was just laughing because you and I talk about that all the time, how it's like, we can never finish a thought because we're just in the flow and getting that inspired action. And the horse was like, you have to let her do it. It's just who she is. She's got to be this way. And then he like brought that up and was like, okay, little chatty, like here you are with all these different thoughts, right? Don't expect me to be this solid deadhead trail horse that you don't actually want me to be because you like the fact that I can like deal with your quirkiness. It was just so funny. Like the, the depth that horses can get when people are like open to it is so fun. But I thought it was wild because he literally was like, yeah, I'm connected to her heart. Like I can feel it. I know when something's going wrong. And like, he basically was like, if I cough, like that's a warning to you. Like if I cough, you need to pay attention to that. And that's how you'll know that something is wrong. And I, I thought that was so interesting that he chose that for one, because obviously that's connected to the chest. Um, but for two, like, it's not like anyone trained him to do that. Like you think about dogs, like service dogs and how they get trained to do that. And they know, and they're, they're aware because they have that intuitive sense, but also because someone showed them, I don't think I've ever talked to a horse that has deliberately been like, I came into your life because I am literally going to be like your service animal. <laughs> yeah. That's so crazy. And I feel like we talked about like this moment I'm sure we talked about it after it happened because I think we recorded after I did that lesson where I just had this like thought of um we were asking a someone one of my clients wanted to work on canter transitions and and he wasn't cantering for her and he always had previously until he just started not and um you know and we were talking about her breath and where was she breathing from and all these other things and he was basic basically it was like a protection mechanism because she was out of balance. And he was like, I'm not going to canter until it's safe for her to canter. You know what I mean? So you like, when I just had these flashes of all of these people and all these trainers and all these things that I've ever seen where people are just like getting more and more tight in their body and pushing harder for the canter transition and like driving them to get it. And like everything is escalating and everything is contracting at the same time when it's like the complete opposite how we just so quickly write stuff off as behavioral when it's like, could you, could you slow down a little bit and look at the bigger picture? So I feel like that level that they can like adapt and go and be like an accountability, you know, or like recognize safety and like be the protective component of something like that is so freaking rad, dude. 
It's so rad. And I think about like some of the horses that I, like I told you, I got on, I got in a bidding war on that site. (laughs) (laughs) You guys didn't listen to our last episode. Amber told me to never go to an auction. And somehow I ended up in an online auction because I saw that I think she was just warning me about the auction. So I was prepared. Um, Why did I I even like, like, why did I even bring that story up? That's why I like started talking about that. And then afterwards I was like, I don't even know why I started talking about that. Probably because we knew at some point, like the auction situation was going to be delivered to you and you needed to be prepared. I know. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And like, so I saw this like Frisian cross paint dude and he was just like, so kind, so sweet. And the dude is like yanking him around, riding him in this river. That's like up to his, like he was swimming and his little head was just out of the water cantering him up like these like concrete stairs and then like loping him around in this like tiny circle he's like slipping all over the place his mouth is gaping you can see his freaking platypus feet (laughs) and I was like this horse I gotta rescue him but let me tell you I got to the point where I did not have the money and I put in one more bid and I was like somebody (laughs) better outbid me because this is not gonna end very well and fortunately someone stepped in thank you universe um and then I had to like come back to reality and be like okay you can't save all the horses and they're here for a reason and then I looked at this and I was just looking at this horse I'm like oh my gosh it's like kind-hearted horse that could literally buck this dude off right now it's just like frantically running around and it's just like yep like because he knows that whoever sees him is gonna look at that and be like okay this horse is very capable safe whatever and that's how he's going to find his person. And it's interesting because I found this other horse, like, um, and I haven't inquired about many. I think I've only inquired about like three. Um, but I inquired about one last night. And what made me like want to get him is I was like, oh my gosh, he's so forgiving with this person. She's like bouncing off the back of her seat in this like chair position, balancing on his face. He's like on uneven ground. And she's like, all right, pick up the canner. And he's like, okay, sure. No problem. I got you. And like, I just think that there, it's so cool how some it's interesting to me though. Cause I see that. And then immediately my mind is like, well, I don't know if he's going to be like that for me because I look at videos of Biggie and how Biggie was like cantering around and he had like mounting issues that he was like cantering around for his previous owner. And like, such a good boy and then he was totally different because like we talked about last time how we just have different lessons that we need to learn and different things that we're figuring out so it is a it's kind of interesting but I feel like so many of them are so forgiving and they know don't you think that they know what they're doing in the current moment if they're trying to like attract you into to their experience because like when I got Kip he was totally like sound um I was able to like walk track canter him. He was, I felt like super safe with him right away. And then when I got him, everything kind of unraveled. And I do think that they know how they have to align with our energy when we get them so that we will get them and like accept the lessons. Don't you? Yeah. I think it's like a combination of that. And then there's like like the protective mechanisms that get put in place when they get like put into a certain frame or they ridden a certain way or kept a certain way where they sort of start to block out like physical discomfort or emotional discomfort where they, you know, they kind of numb or, you know, um, shut down a little bit or whatever. And then when people get them and then the horse starts to feel really safe, like all of a sudden, all of this different stuff starts to sort of show because it's like their body is finally safe enough to like relax and kind of fall apart a little bit. It's like when they talk about when you're on like a healing journey and you've lived most of your life in this like state of stress or, you know, sympathetic is like constantly running. We're chronically, even at a low level, you don't even recognize that it's happening And then when you start to really unravel that stuff, like you're freaking exhausted, you know what I mean? Like, you're like, why am I so tired? Something's wrong with me. And it's like, your body is finally like, oh, we can just like fall apart and like be, and it's like safe to rest, safe to like say, hey, I really hated 
how I had to go around like that and I wanted to bite the people and I couldn't, but now I can express somatically. I feel like that happens so much um, when people get horses. So it's like, I try to remind people, it's like a combination of they're like, is it just me? Cause then people get really hard on themselves about their horse's behaviors like is it me and and it's because there are mirror and you know and and this is my fault and it's like well they also come with their own stuff you know what I mean it's like any relationship where they've already been and had their own life and then you come in and then you choose each other but sometimes you choose each other because you've had those experiences in your life and there's like some deeper healing that needs to happen as like a combination you know what I mean? Of the two of you. So their stuff that they're releasing sometimes isn't about you necessarily, but something that they now feel safe to like express and do I feel like happens a lot, but they get pinned as this horse has behavioral issues or, you know, like the pony stopping people could look at that and be like, Oh, he's stubborn or, you know, it just sucks for them. <laughs> I try, I've been, I just like a lot of the clinics I've been doing lately. And I was talking about it yesterday with somebody where I was like, dang, like it's hard in the sense that you want to be able to give people enough in a weekend to take home and like continue. But like sometimes it's unplugging them from the matrix <laughs> and they're like, oh shit. And then you send them back out into the real world. And I can't, you know, there's, there's such a small amount of support of like trainers and people that are, and I think it's changing, but that have that understanding and that like that lens to see the behaviors and stuff through. So I was like, oh, I had a hangover, I think yesterday because of it, where I was like, dang, like now these people, like, am I doing them a service? <laughs> like, you know, they get done and they're like, oh, I've never thought about it that way. And then I'm like, yep. So, um, okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> like, ah. Oh. I feel like you are doing them a service though, because you are kind of inviting them into this space. And then in a way it's like helping them call their power back because so many of us grow up thinking like, I literally had the mindset of like, everyone should have a trainer and every trainer should have a trainer and then they should have a trainer and like someone to show them. And it's like, why isn't it us developing that partnership with our horse and the horse can be the trainer and the horse can tell us. Cause like we get in that mindset of like, Oh, someone has to tell me what to do. We give our power away to someone who's telling us what to do. And then we might, and I'm not saying this is all the time, but more often than not, then we kind of quit listening to the horse when we're on our own practicing homework or whatever. Cause it's like, Oh, well, this is what we have to do. Cause this is what the trainer said to do. So by you like guiding people and approaching training from a different perspective if even just to like open up that door will at least get them thinking and then they have the tools to be like okay I need to go a little bit deeper I need to take my power back and feel what feels right for me and my horse and then like move on from there like it's not necessarily they have to find somebody and I think that's what's scary is like people want someone else to like give them the answer like they want some they want guidance we want like feedback and I mean I do it too like I ride with people every once in a while I, I have a trainer for certain things but more often than, than not I troubleshoot at first with my own horse so that's what I kind of feel like you're setting them up for is it's like go as far as you can and then fortunately you're online and maybe you give online lessons to them if they really need it. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like you're setting them up to like go a little bit deeper within themselves and you might be throwing them in the deep end, but like sink or swim, man. <laughs> yeah. And these horses are, I feel like the, the bigger portion of everything and the theme is always like go slower. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's like, let's go slower. And giving your trainers permission to go slower. I also talked about how there is that pressure that's maybe it's like the, the collective horse trainer pressure of the expectation of the 30, 60, 90 days. And I know we had a whole episode around that, but there was one little horse here who is just like 
He was so freaking cute. I loved him. He was like a big Jerry and, but he wasn't big. He was still super tiny. He was an Icelandic and, um, my God, he was just so sweet and he was so sensitive and so tapped in. So he just really, the moment everything got slowed down for him, he was like, Oh yes, like this. And even us just standing with him talking about slowing down, he finally started to just like loosen and like lick and chew. And she's like, he never licks and chews. He always holds his seat, you know? And as we're having that conversation of let's not take, you know, the sensitivity away, no desensitizing, but like make him comfortable with the sensitivity and then go slow enough for him to like, not have to feel like he's got like panic and figure it out really fast. Cause I just like trainers in general go so fast, whether it's like emotionally too fast for the horse or even physically like skipping so much of the developmental parts, you know, and then because the horse feels imbalanced and that it can't carry itself, then it gets stamped with like behavioral issue. And it's just like, the horse doesn't even know how to carry you. It doesn't carry itself. It definitely can't carry you. And it's freaking worried. Like, why are we, I don't know. (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> being a horse trainer is hard <laughs> well I will say that like I feel like I'm like deep in this shit right now with Biggie because it's like I'm fighting like my little human ego for some reason and I don't mean to be but like I have always been someone who when I mean, we've talked about this too like I'm just kind of fast and like you were doing the slow walk and Kip and I tried doing the slow walk the other day and it ended up me just like, I was constantly just being like, can you stop? Can you? And then I ended up like twirling the lead rope in front of his face the whole way because he literally was like, I cannot slow down. And I was like, me either, but we're going to do it. And we're going to walk so slow. And it was like the most like frustrating, unrelaxing walk that we've like ever had in our entire lives. And I'm like, okay, I don't know how to slow down. You sure as shit don't know how to slow down. And like with Biggie, it's funny because I'm always asking him to speed up. I'm like, come on, man. So <laughs> I, I, I'm in this weird place with him because he's like my second horse now and I'm working with him every day. And like, I, I realized that there's a lot of value in that for me that I didn't really see before. Like he does something and I go to like rapidly reward him with like treats because I want him to know, or like the Timothy Pellets. I'm like, I want you to know you're doing the right thing. And he's like, hold up like I'm still chewing this first handful that you gave me I gotta close my eyes for a second I need to take a deep breath and then we can do something else and I'm like oh yeah I guess we can do that but like Kip and I like we rush each other all the time and I never knew that until I got biggie because I've always had thoroughbreds and now that I have him I'm like this is so different and it's wild how it like pushes against like my nature and the way that I want to be and almost like my ego like I was just thinking about like taking him to a trainer the other day and I was telling Donna about it and she was like absolutely not like you you're on like what day four of working with him every day like sit down like you need to like write out a plan decide what you want to do like I was like I'm taking him to a trainer because I'm just gonna get fucked off and I need someone to help me and maybe she can get on him for me and she's like okay so you can take five steps back by pushing him over threshold and just getting on him and I'm like you're right you're right you're right like I need to calm down I don't know I'm in a weird place I feel like this is all the stuff resurfacing right like the July stuff where it's like okay you need to let go of like old patterns and things like that so that's where I'm in right now and like I feel like everything is fast tracked but like every oracle card that I pull every friend that I talk to is like you just need to slow down and I'm like I am trying to do that it feels very strange to me (laughs) oh it got so dark in here because there's a storm over my house I know I was like you're disappearing I was like is it my eyeballs (laughs) what's happening (laughs) so funny yeah it's a thing it's like for sure a thing Um, because then when you slow down, it's like all the stuff is like there for you to look at and feel and like, see, so it's like, Ooh, that's uncomfortable. Don't want that. Don't want to talk about that. I don't know. And also, Oh, there she is. Um, the other thing that was coming up in that clinic was that, 
with my own horses, it was interesting because it was technically it was a trail confidence clinic and it was the first one. So I was really feeling out where people were at, what we could do. Definitely moved out into the pasture to do some stuff and it was too fast. So we went back into the arena for some people. But it was all about tapping them into feeling when something needs to be adjusted and just honoring it. So feeling when, oh, I feel the sensation (laughs) raising up in my body and it's anxiety. How do I tell the difference between this is why I wanted to talk about this? Because it was the exact same question that you had asked me the other day where there was one person that had had a situation out on the trail. And um, so it was sort of embedded in her nervous system that the trail is not safe. And so we did a thing where we went super slow. So we had set these very small marks of where the group as a collective was going to go. The first thing was going out of the gate of the arena into the space in between all the way outside. And so in this pasture in between. And so I told everybody, this is where we're going. And everyone would wait for the people to come through the gate. So the gate, we did really slow. So none of the horses were rushing the gate. But it's interesting because when you do go out on trail rides, there's this like fastness that starts to happen, right? Like everyone gets on, the horses are excited and then shit just hits the fan usually right from the get-go. So we made these little milestones (laughs) where I was like, everybody's stopping here. So everyone knew, oh, I only have to make it to the other side of the gate. And then we're all going to check in with everybody. And then we go to the parking lot. Everyone gets through the next gate and waits, checks in. So it was like these little chunks, right? Where everyone got to re-regulate themselves. And we got into this, the little pasture in front of my house. And it's like an open space. So we can all just, the horses that needed to move could move. And the ones that needed to be still. And I was like, in my brain, I was like, how it was having these thoughts of, it's like, identifying which of the horses needed to learn to be and then which of the horses needed to learn to feel safe in the doing so the ones that needed to move were like you can move it's safe to move and the ones that were like we can't stand still it's like this is where we work on this part and one of the people had asked me the lady that had had an issue prior to what she's like well I felt like I was really relaxed and then we stepped past the second gate and I felt her And then I went and then we were both like, oh my gosh, now we're both really nervous. And I looked at the horse and I was like, she doesn't look nervous to me. She looks like this is exciting. You know what I mean? Like there's stuff going, we're in a new place. And she was happy and she was like, oh gosh, what are we doing? Like, this is really cool. Her core complaint about the horse was she doesn't like the work she does. She's bored. She doesn't want to be here. But then when we took her into a place where it looked like she was having fun, the um owner identified it as anxiousness or worry and then she'd asked me like how do you tell the difference how do I know it's not anxiety versus excitement and I said well it's context right like when I look at a horse and they get hyper fixated and everything goes into contraction I want them to move right like I want to kind of clear that like we're finding the softness that to me feels like moving into like anxiety where things are going to have to get discharged and when they there and like usually it gets really like the discharge is really fast and typically not very fun but when the horse is like still moving and just looking and like oh like what is all this I'm like you know it's the story right like but if you have a story about that horse's ears and where it's looking that that is going to turn into out of control you can quickly bring that story up in yourself and create a, a situation so the context of the what's going on I feel like makes such a big difference you can't hear that no because there's so much rain and like thunder and stuff over here and I'm like please hold on little wi-fi but I swear and so yeah so my wi-fi might die and if it does Amber will say goodbye to you guys but um So I feel like that's so relevant for like, I am the queen of making up that story and being like, well, I want to ask him to canter, but when he goes in the canter, he's going to be super excited. And then he's going to buck and then I'm going to fall off and all my teeth are going to fall out. And I, I like come up like all these scenarios that are like so dumb, so whatever. And especially with my horse that I've like, and I think 
now like realizing that I'm like confusing nerves with excitement and I'm having all these like recent realizations I'm like okay my horse is being so excited because I can never stop him on trail and I think of how I am like dragging Biggie to turn him out and I'm like I can't stop for you right now like can we just go from the barn to the field like I don't want to stop and when I do have to stop for him to graze I'm like come on man like like 15 feet um and then I think of Kip and how he doesn't and I feel like he's like if you're not able to get excited right now and you're stuffing this shit down, I'm going to be excited for both of us and you're not going to be able to stop it. And it is going to be like the car that's rolling downhill and you're trying to stop me at the bottom. And like, that's exactly how it goes. And he does fuck and he always keeps me safe and stuff like that. And once we actually get going, I'm always like, good boy, this is so fun. And like, I have so much fun with him, but it is weird how like when it first comes up in my body, I immediately am like, oh no there's no way I could be excited. I have to be anxious about this. I'm definitely nervous. And I realize now that that's the foreboding joy thing that you were telling me where, where, so I, I Amber and I were talking about this, um, off script a couple of days ago. And, um, she was like, I, I was just telling her a personal experience and she was like, well, at some point in your life, your body felt that joy like wasn't safe like you got excited about something and maybe it got taken away from you or whatever and I immediately bawling I knew exactly what she was like it's like the whole memory of the universe is like yep here's the memory here's what you need to clear okay so I'll keep going because we lost Shaylee but basically she had a memory about a situation where that in fact did happen and actually happened multiple times. And so what can happen when we have the experience of something really exciting, being really excited about something, just joy and something happening to create that being taken away or being tied into maybe a painful memory like that was attached to that joy. And what our nervous system will start to do is say, I feel that experience here. It comes, oh, it's not safe to actually feel the joy. So the foreboding joy is when we block it, we stop it before it happens. And um, we do it in a lot of different situations. But that experience of understanding that, recognizing it and being like, this is possibly what I'm doing can I create a new story around that? Because what is happening right in this moment is not the same situation that I experienced that has created this disconnect or this inability to want to experience this thing. So we do that in a lot of different ways. And so, you you know, invitation just to look at that. Like, is there anywhere in my life that I may be cutting myself short or identifying something that could potentially be fun and exciting. And if I remain open to that experience, I could have this amazing experience or am I shutting it down due to an old story or an old experience and I'm identifying it as not safe and it's anxiety versus I could be excited about a potential really cool opportunity or experience or relationship or whatever that is. So. That is your podcast for this week. (laughs) So if you guys have any questions, comments, any aha moments, we would love to hear about them. It makes us super happy. Um, You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook. We are obviously always letting you guys know about our Tea House membership that we have. Um, We are about to launch a 21-day vision quest that will happen month of August and invited to participate in that if you are in the membership. So if that's feeling like something exciting for you, we will launch it publicly um, probably August, June, July, August in September, but we're only gonna do it for members to start off with. So, and actually since it's the beta, you're gonna get it for a very sizable discount. So just throwing that out there in case that feels like something that you're interested in. We do our once a month tea party, which is coming up at the end of this month. I think it's actually Margarita Monday um, episode or um, session. And we have our guests 
that we come on that we eventually release, but we invite anyone that's in the membership to join those calls. And if you have questions during the podcast, you can throw them in the chats and get your questions answered real time. So that's super fun. Um, there's other things. Oh yeah. Our book club. And we do our calls with the authors. And so we have another one that's going right now. So lots of fun, exciting stuff in there. And we have a really cool little community, um, on Facebook that you get to join as well. So I'll put the link for that in the show notes and um, we'll see you guys next week.